Lord forgive me for this trap shit Sergeant Smack make it backflip Telly hanged it with the action With the vital speaking Spanish Frank Matthews how I vanish Poof Came back like I'm King Tut Gold BBS is on a beamer When fat cat was tearing queens up Fall off the prop and not the re up Fly like Puerto Rican Jesus Uptown like I'm baby man Just caught a touchdown From the base Speed, power, boats, money, Miami. Sounds like a storyline for a movie or a television series. You mix in big time politicians and drug dealers, it can't miss. And for a leading man, you have a handsome, strapping, macho guy who's part daredevil, part engineering genius, and a big part self-promoter. Only in the movies? Only on television? No. Expose's Noah Nelson found the story and the lead character. Homicide detective, Greg Smith. Why was there such a strong connection between the world of the high-speed powerboats and, and crime? In the early to mid-80s, the, the powerboat was the method of choice with the smugglers. Apparently, Don Arano was widely known on both sides of the law. Society's upper crust and its underbelly were lured by his boats and his style. He even built a boat for one of his new friends, then Vice President George Bush. Bush still pilots his cigarette, Fidelity, around Kenny Bunkport. Well, as savvy as Bush was about a lot of things, uh, he was simply naive about Don. Uh, in short, I think he was in awe of Don Aaron of the legend. In 1985, Arano's big league connections paid off. His USA Racing Company landed a $1.7 million deal to build chase boats for the U.S. Customs Service. The high-speed catamarans were designed to intercept drug smugglers off the Florida coast. Arano landed the no-bid contract as if he were the only game in town. The boats were called Blue Thunder. Were the boats really that good, or was it Arano's relationship with the then vice president that, that made the contract with customs happen? It was both. The boats were excellent, and they were friends. It was what you'd call a perfect marriage. Uh, that's the way business is done, isn't it? The deal called for Arano to build Blue Thunders for $150,000 apiece. There were other good boats around, but they wouldn't have that Arano mystique. I don't think Customs had an inkling of Don's other side. For the same reason that the Bush was enamored by Don Arano, I think Customs was. About Don Arano the legend. But not long after the first boat hit the water, Arano, the legend, quietly sold the company and the government contract to this man, Ben Kramer, one of Miami's biggest drug smugglers, Detective Greg Smith. Ben Kramer, uh, as we know, owned a uh, powerboat company, Apache, and he also played very hard. Uh, it's common knowledge that uh, Mr. Kramer was involved in the smuggling business. Customs now had a deal with the devil, trying to catch drug smugglers with boats supplied by a man who smuggled drugs. William Von Robb was commissioner of customs at the time. It's been confirmed by law enforcement agents that uh, Arano had a spotty background that he associated with underworld figures. Does that bother you now? I think it's embarrassing. I was shocked and surprised at two things. One, that we had dealings with an individual with as questionable a past as he did. And secondly, that that information hadn't been made known to me as head of the agency. And government officials were also embarrassed that Arano, the vice president's friend, orchestrated the deal. It is now known that Ben Kramer and his father used freshly laundered drug dollars to buy Arano's company and the customs boat contract. By the time drug agents on the trail put it all together, the Kramers and the government were already partners. The flashy world of the powerboats had lost some of its shine. 
Tom Cash of the Drug Enforcement Administration. When we looked at the, the money and traced the money back, we began to draw the common denominator of the offshore boat business and, by inference, uh, marijuana smuggling. The deal in which Arano sold the government's contract turned out to be a part of one of the biggest money laundering schemes ever uncovered. The investigation ended with convictions for Ben Kramer, his father Jack, and their attorney, Melvin Kessler. Investigators tell Exposé that powerboat king Don Arano knowingly received hundreds of thousands of dollars in laundered drug money for the sale of his company, and that Arano raked in lots of cash for boats he'd never built. The IRS was looking at Arano very closely at the time of his death, as was DEA. And indeed, it now is known that uh, there were uh, strong reasons to believe that the boat business was a, a beautiful money laundering scam. In January 1987, the IRS sees records of Aaron Al's sale of his company to the Kramers. Just one day before he would have been subpoenaed to appear before a grand jury, Aaron Al was murdered. Oh, for a white male in his late 30s, dark complexion. After a four-year investigation, police arrested 41-year-old hitman Bobby Young for Aaron O's murder. Young had already been indicted in Florida for another murder and was serving time in Oklahoma on a cocaine charge. His lawyer in the cocaine case? Melvin Kessler, the same attorney involved with the Kramers when they bought Arano's company. We feel that Mr. Arano's murder was uh, a paid contract. Are you looking into any connection between Kramer and the and the murder of Aaron Al. Yes, we are. This is the US-1 Apache Ben Kramer, and this one, Jim, is another boat to watch. Yeah, so the deep V haul should take, whoa, look out. Look at it, but they're right up on his tail there. Now he knows us in. Two of the guys have disappeared. It looks like only the purple man is going. These guys really have to be in physical condition to ride these boats. You cannot get in there and be out of condition. A good point, Dick. These guys are athletes. They have to be in good shape. These guys actually will take several G. We'll do this play as well. Al Copeland Sr.'s got a little catching up to do, but so far he is riding just fine out there. We'll be keeping an eye on him. Here's the U.S. 1 Apache out of North Miami Beach, Florida, Ben Kramer. He's got to be one of the boats favored in this race coming in. A strong competitor all the way. That's Apache. And Dick, if you notice, these boys in this particular boat are not sitting down. They're standing up. They're absorbing the waves of rough water here today by just bending their knees slightly. Actually, at this point, Jim, it doesn't look like it's a particularly rough ride for this boat. It's cutting right through the waves, and they're not really fighting the waves at this point. They're riding pretty consistent. And Sal McClure, Dick, knows about it here. He has missed an offshore race in seven seasons. Right now he's riding at third place in the Seahawks. Here's your leader. This is the U.S. 1 Team Apache out of North Miami, Florida. Here's your leader in the open class, Ben Kramer. He manufactures boats. He talks about the benefits of racing on the circuit. Every boat is a, another prototype. The boats that we run on a race circuit, uh, we're testing driveways. We're testing uh, the Kevlar layups. We're testing the inner structure of the boat. Uh, if we can run a boat out here in three to five foot seas at 90 miles an hour, and the boat's strong enough, and the boat is definitely strong enough for the average consumer to go out and run 65 miles an hour. So we feel that, uh, you know, we do all our testing on the offshore circuit and take it back to the shop, reevaluate the boats, and uh, put what's good into the production boats. So Ben Kramer with an observation that makes it a little bit more interesting to boat owners all across the country, knowing that they actually are testing some of the innovations right here on the race circuit. Team Apache, the lead boat in the open class right now. Now let's go back to open class action. Here comes the winner in US-1, Team Apache. And of course, Ben Kramer's got to be happy about this thing. <laughs> I hope they stay in the boat. They got excited as they came down there. But uh, Team Apache certainly with a fine run. A good win for them, one that they really fought for. It looked for a while like they might have some problems when
when Seahawk took over the lead, but they came back up in there when Seahawk went out, and now Team Apache takes first place in this particular race. And it certainly was not comfortable in the seas off Rochester, New York. Where's Ben Kramer uh, does have an advantage in the rough water, and he's getting way out of shape. Look out, Ben! This is going to be a pick-and-choose-it race, George. There's going to be no throttle-down work today. Systems right now is hooked up. It's certainly... Oh, they just... They just stopped the Apache. Apache In an stopped. instant, that accident almost took Bobby Sassenti's life. He suffered a basal skull fracture and is one of the few human beings who've ever had that injury and were able to walk away from it. Do you feel comfortable in a smaller boat? Uh... Not really. I'd much rather have my boat and Bob Sassente, but uh, Sal was gracious enough to let me borrow uh, his boat and Gus, and it's probably as good as you can get. I chased, chased the same boat for the last two years, so it can't be hauled bad. <laughs> in three weeks, Ben Kramer's performed a miracle uh, back from a horrible accident, and, and best of luck to you today. You deserve it. Thanks, Rich. Appreciate it, Phil. Thanks. <laughs> The twisted wreckage lies piled in an exercise yard at the Federal Correction Center southwest of Miami. The little two-man helicopter never had a chance, according to federal prison authorities. They say the moment pilot Charles Stevens and inmate Ben Kramer planned the escape, it was doomed. As it was lifting off and the inmate apparently was hanging on to the outside of the helicopter, the propeller hit the top of the security fence and toppled over just outside the fence where it sits now. Kramer ran a multi-million dollar marijuana smuggling ring and had been known to move millions of dollars between bank accounts in Europe and the Virgin Islands. Stevens flew a small two-man helicopter exactly like this one. It's called a Bell 47 and they're at least 30 years old. But other helicopter pilots around the airport here say, in fact, Stevens couldn't fly at all. Pilots who watched Stevens try and fly described it this way. He didn't seem nervous, skittish, strange, or anything. No, except he just couldn't fly a helicopter. Both of the men, tonight, are in Jackson Memorial Hospital with broken bones. It's not how they planned it, but both of them left the prison by helicopter. Yo, yo, we back. It's your boy Pop a lot. Mob ties. We on our way to Florida with it. Miami. North Miami Beach to be exact. I'm gonna need the whole city in the comment box for this one. This is wow. Now, in an effort to try to bring y'all the most untold, undocumented, unheard, wildest stories that this war has to offer, this by far has to rank up there. Now, today we are gonna be covering a guy by the name of Benjamin Barry Kramer. Better known as Ben Kramer, Patchy forty seven. Speedboat God, weed smuggling Hefe, whatever you want to call him. It's hard to put one title on him, especially after doing so much research. It's like he did so much stuff. I'm going to try to break down the details and, and get to the start and try to give you all a short run through everything. Now, his, well, it's hard to say, like, what's the most <laughs> claim to fame or, but. The first thing that is going to be highly documented was on February 3rd, 1987, a guy by the name of Don Arnau was murdered in his car, and that was at the end of 188th Street in North Miami Beach, where his boat companies operated. Now, Arnau had just left the meeting with a guy by the name of Bob Sarsetti, who was part owner of Apache Power Boats. Now, together, he was a partner with none other than Ben Kramer. Now, witnesses said that the uh, powder blue Lincoln pulled up next to Don Arnau's car from the opposite direction. And then when Arnau rolled down his window, the driver opened fire on him. Another witness tried to follow the Lincoln as it fled, but it could not catch the killer or the killers. And the Lincoln drove over the grass to a getaway. Now, nearly a decade after that murder, two men pleaded no contest to the charges related to Arnau's killing. Now, in 1995, a career criminal and a hitman by the name of Bobby Young admitted to shooting Arnau and pleaded no contest to second-degree murder, eventually providing a full confession. In 2009, 
shortly before his death. Now, Ben Kramer, who was winner of the 1986 American Power Boat Association Offshore Championship, he was a very prominent racer. He pleaded no contest to manslaughter in 1996 for those charges. Now, Kramer was a bit, Kramer, it's alleged that Kramer had a business dispute with Arnau after buying the latter's USA racing team, but was forced to sell it back to Arnau after Customs Service refused to do business with him. Now, Kramer was already in prison, serving a life sentence with the possibility of no parole following a 1988 and a 1989 conviction for drug smuggling and gun charges. And that's after at the time of the admitted murder. Now, he was convicted of that murder and I seen where a judge upheld that murder. So that murder happened in February of 87. He was convicted in 88 of 89. So the 80s was wow. A lot of people really only talk about Sal Magluta, Willie Falcone. Uh, we know about Grisel de Blanco. But one thing about Miami, um, it was a lot of players. Um, and it seems like Ben Kramer was one of the biggest players in that game. And not only was he one of the biggest players in that game, he never stopped playing after they took him off the field. That's the shit with him. So I didn't even, and, and that's the wildest, that's the wildest thing. Sometimes when you uncover these stories, I didn't even tap in with him for the murders. I seen something and I'm like, well, let me see what's going on with dude. And everything from there just kind of took off, blew my mind. Now on Wednesday, April 19th, 1989 this was after he was convicted um before they found out about the murders miami herald is going to go on to say ben kramer loved helicopters almost as much as he loved power boats during offshore races the legendary skipper would have his dad trail him as a, a trail him in a chopper just in case now friends say kramer was fascinated by flying machines that he talked about like he was a kid now on that particular Monday, a helicopter let him down, and it let him down hard. During a daredevil escape attempt from the Metropolitan Correctional Center in Southwest Dade, Kramer suffered a broken ankle when a, hel when a helicopter trying to spring him snagged on a fence and crashed. Now, they're going to say the brash staff from Freedom was just, was just him, was his life. This was his love for boats and aircrafts. It was vintage Kramer as a racer and powerboat builder in North Miami Beach. He was considered a brash and a patient man, but he was a superb skipper. Now, they're going to say as an inmate, he has a reputation for brashliness and it never stopped there. So that was just one thing. So just imagine, just let's just picture that, man. A dude on a federal yard try to have a helicopter pulled down and, has, and escape him out that bitch. <laughs> that is just, just wild. But does it stop there? Uh, of course not. Now on September 6th of 1996, the Miami Herald reported with the headline, Pot in Jiff Jars Puts Inmate in Sticky Situation. They would go on to detail that in a massive breach of security, murder for hire suspect at the time, Benjamin Barry Kramer was allegedly caught trying to pass marijuana hidden inside of a Jiff Jar of peanut butter to a convicted killer. Now, what makes the allegations so egregious at the time is that Kramer, who once tried to escape from federal detention and a helicopter is considered the biggest security risk in Dade County Jail. Now Kramer is housed in a six floor cell under constant watch by correctional officers. Every time Kramer is walked from jail to Metro Justice to the Metro Justice Building, Metro Dade SWAT officers and police dogs scour the courthouse for bombs, weapons and other devices. Now, I'm seeing the life that he lived when he was free. And even as a prisoner, I could see how it's no holes barred, everything on go with him. Now, this probably has to be, if not the wildest, one of the wildest cases that I've covered on Mob Ties. Um, it's a few I could think of. Super Dave up there. Um, Ronnell Wilson, another wild one. But y'all get in the comment box, man. Y'all let me know. 
if this is not the wildest story that we have covered, and if it's a wilder one, y'all point me in the right direction, man. Y'all follow me on Instagram, on Twitter, P-O-P underscore A underscore L-O-T. You know I'm going to provide the substance. Y'all make sure y'all hit the bell below. Y'all comment below where we need to go to, who we need to cover. Y'all tweet me. Y'all direct message me, email me, CC me, call me, stop me in the street, whatever you want. I'm here for it. It's your boy Pop a lot. Mob, mob, mob ties.